start. Today we have small polls, not, not many people, but still I'm glad to see every uh, everyone who don't afraid, who are not afraid of uh, math and English. <laughs> <laughs> so today we have uh, special guests. It's uh, it's a mathematician from Poznan University. Uh, and actually, uh, he uh, arrived here about an hour ago. Yes, yes, about an hour before. Uh, so he came to us just uh, from 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 the, right from the airport. Yeah. Yes, from the airport. And it's first time when <laughs> we have uh, such close. Um, yeah, you see. So today we uh, we are going to talk about normal numbers. Uh, and our guest will try to explain us uh, what it is. And um, also, I, I think he uh, will tell a little bit about his project about uh, traveling, mm -hmm. mathematical yeah. traveling yeah. and vlogging. Uh, so, yeah. let's just let's begin. <laughs> Okay. So a couple things. I I want to make this uh, interactive talk in the sense that I don't want to just be up there talking and everyone's confused. If there's something I say, and this could even be because the English is not understandable, please ask. So we're going to keep this fairly informal. I prefer these. Um, as far as the uh, YouTube vlog, so I just started this. There are no videos up yet, but the idea is. As a, um, as a math professor, often I'm traveling the world, I'm working with different co-authors in different places, giving talks. Last academic year I traveled for 20 weeks, it was over Asia, Eastern and Western Europe, North America, Could have, sometimes I go to South America. And this is a story that's not really known outside of the mathematical community, basically that if you work really, really hard, you make some, uh, enough of an international reputation, you start to make connections, you get invited to all these crazy places. So. I both have gotten a chance to do a lot of math, make a lot of great professional connections, and also explore very interesting places. And so my YouTube channel, I want to actually show what sort of lifestyle this is, because this is something you never, you know, when you're a mathematician, you never hear training to be as a student, you never think, okay, I can get to go to this interesting place, I can go to Asia for a month and do this, just because this person's interested in my work. And um, so I want to show what this is about, and so we'll do all kinds of interesting things on the channel, for example, in Kharkiv, I want to both see pretty churches and also go to some crazy markets, you know, kind of anything in between. Um, so it's mostly from an American perspective, you know, what would a probably American or maybe uh, Western European find interesting, interested, but if anyone's interested in participating, I have some sample footage. I was in the Czech Republic for about two weeks. I got footage in Opava and Ostrava. And after Kharkiv, I'm going to go to Utrecht, directly to Utrecht in the Netherlands, and I'm going to film there. So I would be interested in, you know, talking to anybody here, going around town or doing stuff where you can just tell me what you're here for. So, um, and I have all this equipment to deal with that too. So after my talk, I don't want to waste too much time in my talk. Okay, so um, just let me, let me just get a kind of idea of, I, I don't know too much about the Ukrainian educational system. Um, how many people here have seen the concept of a limit, say, in a high school math class? Pretty much everyone, okay, it's a couple of people haven't. Have you seen it or not? A uh, limit? Everybody, okay, so I just assume yes. Okay, yes or not? No. Okay, no, okay. Um, so I, I'll just ignore it when I say it. Uh, it won't be too important, but, um, but basically the main thing you need to understand is just some idea of what a limit is, so um, then I can do a lot more. And all the idea of a limit is, is it's kind of, um, you have some, some function that's, it's moving around and doing stuff. Well, what does it get close to as you get closer to some other point? So, for example, if you had a function um, like this, okay, maybe it's um, this value down here. Let's say that this is 3 or something like that. And, well, this is some function f of x. Okay, what happens is x gets closer to 3. What does the function f of x do? Well, it doesn't get closer to this point, it gets closer to this point. Let's say that's 5, and let's say this is 2. So we would say that limit as x goes to 3, sorry, x goes to 3, of f of x is equal to uh, 5, because it gets closer and closer to that value. And that's a very informal definition. This can be done precisely. So if you know the precise definition, don't you know, feel too bad. 
Um, so where do I erase? This is here. Okay. Anyways, if you don't, if you're not familiar with this or not too comfortable, it's okay. It won't be completely necessary. But we want to. We're going to kind of be talking about limits the whole talk, more or less. Uh, but you can kind of dodge it if you want. Okay, so I want to first say what's a normal number, and I want to give an intuitive idea of what a normal number is. So if you remember, every real number has a decimal expansion. So for example, um, pi is 3.14159265351. I can keep going if you want, but that should be enough. Or we can do, you know, one third. This one is a bit easier, 0.3333. When, when should I stop? We can keep writing. Okay, stop. Um, I also want to write another one that's rational, just to kind of emphasize a certain point. One fourth is 0 0.25000008. Zero, 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 okay. It only stops in the sense that it ends in all zeros. It's still an infinite string of letters. We can, we, when I say letters, we think of an alphabet, like um, 0, 1, up to 9. This is our alphabet. So just think, okay, you know, in, in Russian or Ukrainian, of course, those, they, well, they have different alphabets. Um, English also has a different alphabet, and they're, okay, English, there's 26 letters in the alphabet. I don't know off the top of my head how many letters are in the Russian alphabet. Does anyone know? 32. What is it? 32. 32? Okay, how many in Ukrainian? Three, two, three, three, three. Okay, so it's about the same, yeah. Yes. Well, there's also that, that's 61 letter in Russian. That's how I know it's Russian and not Ukrainian. You know this, um, if, this letter? <laughs> it looks like a 61 to me, kind of. No, <laughs> so, Anyway, imagine, um, imagine that you have some decimal expansion of some real number, and what would we want to say if it's random? Okay? And I'm putting random in quotes because there's a lot of different ways you can interpret the idea of randomness. But let's just go from a very, very um, basic perspective on this. So um, imagine if, if my decimal expansion is random in the most simple sort of way. You can imagine like you have a 10-sided die, you know, like for, for these games. Um, and you're rolling the dice, and what happens if you do this? Well, all of your digits, 0 through 9, say 0, 1, up to 9, you should expect to occur with frequency 1 and 10. You know, this, the dice isn't, it's not, there's no, no side shaved off, there's no sort of shadiness, it's just a fair die. So each of these would have frequency 1 and 10. And I'm not saying what I mean by frequency yet, there's kind of just the probability of them coming up. Okay, now there's 10 possibilities there. What about two digits together? 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, all the way up to 9, 9. So there's 100 different possibilities of, you know, say a 9 followed by a 9, or a 5 followed by a 7, and so on. Well, in the most simple sort of case, each of these would have probability 1 in 100, for showing up, right? And in general, if you have any grouping of k of them together, it would be 1 in 10 to the k, would be the probability. Okay. So if a real number, if its decimal expansion has that property, then we say it's normal in base 10. Does the idea make sense? I want to make sure it's clear. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we say that x is normal in base 10. Normal in base 10, if it has this property. Now, the reason I was bringing up limits is, well, how do we actually define what we mean by um, 7 showing up 1 in 10 times? It's actually a limit. What we say is, we look at the decimal expansion, and we say, how many times does 7 occur in the first n digits? Divide that by n, and then take the limit as n goes to infinity. So that's how we, so like I said, probability is something that's really difficult, even philosophically, to define. But this is how we define it. So if you want that precise definition, um, and there, there's a reason you're going to need this precise definition, because I'm going to give you guys a difficult problem to think about. You don't have to, there's no chance you'll solve it right now, but if you want to email me later, you can, you know. Um, it's simple looking, but believe me, it's hard. You know, I love these problems that are kind of, they look like they're easy, but they're really not. Okay, so this was actually, um, in 1909, Borel, who was a, very important mathematician. He defined this property of normal number, and he showed in some precise sense that if you pick a real number at random, whatever that means, then the probability of it being normal in base 10 is 
In fact, the probability of a number being normal in any single base, in every base at the same time, is 100%. So I didn't define normality in base 7, but you can imagine you could define this for base 7 pretty easily. You have digits 0 through 6. You have probability 1 in 7, 1 in 49, and so on. Um, so is anyone here a mathematician or not? Okay, then I won't, I won't say the specific word what I mean by typical real number. We'll dodge. We won't go there. But there's some precise way of saying this. You can just intuitive. Now, when I say 100%, it's, it's, it's really kind of hard. What, what do we mean by that? Because look at these examples here. One fourth, one fourth and one third. These are not normal in base 10, right? For one third, three shows up with frequency 100%, and then no other digits show up at all. That's not normal. Same with this number. You have the only thing, okay, two shows up with frequency zero. Okay, you can show up once and still have frequency zero because we're taking this limit. The number of times two shows up, up to position n is one. Okay, one and then divided by n, the limit as n goes to infinity of one over n is zero. So the only thing here that shows up with any positive frequency is the digit zero. And everything else doesn't show up at all. So these are not normal numbers. So um, should I very quickly repeat this definition for newcomer if we would have showed up? Okay. I'm going to just say this really quickly. A number is normal in base 10. If you look at its decimal expansion, and each of the digits, 0 through 9, show up with frequency 1 and 10. Each pair of digits, 0, 0 through 9, 9, show up with frequency 1 and 100. Every group of three digits, 0, 0, 0 through 9, 9, 9, show up with frequency 1 and 1,000, and so on. And I said that according to Borel, the typical real number in some precise sense is normal, not just in base 10, but every single base. But what about examples of normal numbers? Well, this isn't normal, that's not normal. Okay? Because it's, you know. um, what about pi? How many people think pi is probably normal, or is normal? Any ideas? Normal. You think it's normal? Okay. Any other? Oh. But what? Okay, did you read something beforehand? Yes. Okay. So let's not spoil it. <laughs> Just intuition, it's okay, okay, this is the thing about math. I'm sorry, actually it was uh, a, little, uh, a little hint was inside an, an abstract of our lecture. So, oh. so people, oh, they might yeah, not know. Those okay, people right. who read it yeah. like, carefully. Yeah. Okay, so you're not eligible. So people who haven't read the abstract, any <laughs> intuition. And, and I just want to say in math, it is really, really okay to be wrong as a mathematician. I am spending most of my time just banging my head on the whiteboard. It's these rare moments of clarity you have. Okay, it's different than in the sciences where you're, you're doing experiments in a lab. Those are different difficulties you have. In math, I mean, you are just completely clueless most of the time. And then you just get an occasional moment of clarity and you that. And usually your intuition is wrong at least at first. So it's okay to be wrong. Um, so pi, actually nobody knows. <coughs> this is normal. In any case, this is actually a big oak. So let me actually say that you know, there are these people that they could, they, um, they write these programs, they compute trillions of digits of pi. I don't know what the current record is, but you do any statistical test for randomness on this, and it looks like it's probably random. But we don't even know, for example, if the digit 9 even shows up infinitely often. We don't know if the digit 2 shows up infinitely often. We are very, very far from any progress at all. It may be the case that pi looks nice up to 7 quadrillion digits, and then it just all zeros and ones. We don't know that. Because imagine, if you compute you know, the first Google digits, well, what do you know about the normality of pi? You know absolutely nothing, because there are infinitely many digits. A Google is no progress at all. So it's good for a conjecture. This is one of the differences, I would say, between science and mathematics. You know, in science, you don't know the rules that the universe works by, so you do experiments to guess at the rules. Math is a completely different situation. You set the rules, you set the axioms, and you can do experiments to make a guess at what the right theorem is, but you actually need a proof, which is a series of logical statements to get to your theorem. So in math, you can do something like this. You can do a lot of experiments. You can compute a lot of digits, but ultimately it tells you nothing. It just gives you a good guess. So that's an important fundamental difference. Um, there's reasons, of course, why both are true. It's, it's just the nature of the beast. So my feeling is that this is probably normal in all bases, but I think it's a few hundred years until anyone's going to know we're all going to be dead, probably, unless someone lives a really long time. Um, 
So um, what about square root of 2? And well, I can write out 1.142, 1 and so on. Um, just square root of 2. It's even a nicer number to work with than pi. That's probably also normal, but nobody knows. So this one might be done within maybe a couple of my lifetimes. So I'm not going to say three or 400 years. Let's say maybe 100 years is my feeling. There's at least a little, little bit of a thing that might kind of get in that direction. There is absolutely nothing that's going to resolve this uh, issue with pi in my whole life. You know, that we have no progress at all. So um, Burrell actually con uh, conjectured that all of these square root type numbers, I would say algebraic irrational numbers, are normal in every base. And he conjectured that in 1909, but there's um, very minimal progress. There, there was a tiny, tiny bit of progress about 10 years ago, but it's um, the methods that were used cannot be extended to really go that much further. So, um, so what's an example? Does anyone have any guesses on what an example of a number normal in base 10 could be? I don't think I put this in the abstract. If you read Wikipedia, you would know. But. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, that's a hint you want the extra credit. Well, then, 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 the, um, then the question's going to be proved that it's normal, and that's what's really hard. But do, do you know, did you find an example? No. Okay. I think I'm going to claim that the simplest possible thing you could come up with actually works. So let me write down something, and this is what I promise is very easy looking, but actually very difficult. Point one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, up to ninety-nine, one hundred, one hundred one, and so on. So you take all the natural numbers, you write them in base ten, and then just put them together. So this was, this is normal in base 10. This is due to Chambernon in 1933. So notice this. 1909, Borel said that almost every real number is normal in all base. There wasn't an example of a number normal in any base until 1933. So this is a strange thing. Let me kind of make maybe an unjustified comparison but something in physics. Uh, dark matter. We infer its existence based on all these interesting gravitational effects, but no one's ever touched or detected it. Okay, we don't know for sure it exists, but here they actually, there's a reason, there's a way Borel was able to show that they do exist, but no one had an example. So finally, some years later, at least this example is given. Now, this is kind of the most obvious thing to write down, but this is my challenge to everyone, is prove that this is normal in base 10. This is actually very hard. Uh, it's doable. If you know what a limit is, you know enough to do this problem, but it's tricky. So this is actually a problem I give if I have a very enthusiastic and smart, say, undergraduate or high school student who can, you know, solve all kinds of problems and has a lot of energy. I give them this problem because, let's say, about maybe 98% of the time it'll stop them in their tracks. But they can at least come up with some ideas. So um, I tried this problem when I was a PhD student. My uh, advisor gave it to me, and I made some progress, but I wasn't able to finish it. So email me if you can... Um, by yourself, prove that this is normal in base 10. And I give him this problem because you don't need to know anything to do it. But it's so tricky. So let me give another more interesting example. So that's due to Champernon in 1933. Um, points 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, and so on. Um, does anyone recognize the sequence? Fibonacci. Well, we'll get to Fibonacci in a minute. It grows slower than that. Nice. Uh, numbers. Numbers, yes. Maybe prime numbers, maybe it's a translation. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, so simple, it's the same kind of idea. You can't break it up probably. So yeah, these are prime numbers. So this is actually a much more interesting result. And I'm not giving you guys this one because this is you need to know this is a little bit too way too hard of a problem. This is due to Copeland and Erdish. So Copeland and Erdish. And this is in 1946. Okay. So they proved that this number is normal in base 10. Now let me remark that there's nothing special about base 10. I could write the prime numbers in base 83. I don't know what they are off the top of my head of base 83, so, or base 7 or whatever. And that different number that you get will be normal in base 83. But we don't know, is this number, this real number, is this normal in base 7? I have no idea. It's because it's a different real number you get by writing them in base 7. So these types of constructions are only good for one base. Um, and uh, what was I going to say? So um, 
But this this one, yeah, this one's quite a bit harder. You only use pretty much basic stuff, but it's it's a bit quite a bit of a jump from this. Um, there may be some other interesting sequences, so let's keep going. Um, what about polynomials? You know, polynomial like n squared, n cubed, and so on? That also works. In fact, there are a lot of these types of sequences, so there's, I don't want to dwell too much on this because there's been a lot of work done for these examples. Um, generally, in, in math, a lot of times, giving a specific example is harder than proving some general result. So proving that these things exist is actually pretty easy. Um, giving a specific example like this, it's hard. Even something harder is like proving that pi is normal. You know, this is something, if you're young enough, if you're under 40, and you can prove that pi is normal, you get your Fields Medal. Now, that's the problem with the Fields Medal, you can't be over 40. I'm 38, so I'll be probably ineligible. For, I'm not going to get it anyways, but um, maybe you get a Wolf Prize if you're older. But it's really that hard of a problem. It's some, and, and, but these, these are challenging, but they're not quite that hard. But let me give another example that's unknown. Um, what about powers of 2? Points 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, and so on. Um, it's conjectured that this real number is normal in base 10, but this is also an open question. So what kind of happens when these numbers grow too quickly, you have some issues. So prime numbers, does anyone know roughly how large the nth prime number is? It's approximately n times log n. So the nth prime is approximately n times uh, log of n, as it turns out. That's not obvious. So you have to trust me on that one. Um, so this sequence, it grows uh, pretty slowly, actually, only a little bit faster than linear. This grows exponentially. Now, just because you mentioned Fibonacci numbers, let's look at that as well, because we have the same problem. That's also unknown. So Fibonacci numbers, does everyone know Fibonacci numbers? OK, I'll explain. I'll explain. You start out with 1 and 1, and then you add them together, and you get 2. And then you add them together, you get 3. Add these together, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, and so on. So every new one is produced by adding the previous two together. So these are called the Fibonacci numbers. Fibonacci numbers. Okay. And there should be a space in here. Okay, sorry, my writing isn't always the best, but you can Google these. There's all kinds of things known about them. And these actually grow exponentially. Does anyone happen to know how fast they grow, roughly? Okay, so if we call this f sub n, f sub n is approximately the golden mean 1 plus root 5 divided by 2 to the n. So this number, this is approximately 1.618 to the n. So this actually does grow, this is also an exponentially growing sequence, so it's kind of some way similar to this. Uh, these are hard questions. Like I said, they're not as hard as the one with pi, but you would still be, um, and among certain groups, you would have a lot of street cred if you're able to show those are normal. So, and yes, that is actually the right word. You know, it's, you know, it sounds strange, math street cred. Um, so these are examples. Um, let me ask a harder question. What about a number that's normal in every single base? at the same time. And when I say ask for example, an algorithm is fine too. Because for example, this thing with prime numbers, well, you definitely have to write an algorithm because what's the nth prime number? Well, this is memorized. I know that off the top of my head. But if you start going out too far, then I don't know after some point. So I need to compute what's the next prime number. So when you really think about it abstractly, any of these types of constructions, it's basically an output of a computer program. Okay, this is a very simple computer program. You just do some for loop and you print out, you know, 4n is 1, 2, infinity, or whatever. Um, we're not assuming any limits on resources. How many people have some programming background? Just, okay. Okay, so just basic idea of computer science, any? Good. All right. So um, there's, there's a lot of connections with computer science here. So one of the nice things about normality is it touches on a lot of different areas of mathematics, and I won't be able to fully promise uh, or deliver on the promise of my abstract that I can talk about all of those because it would take too long to give some of the background, but we can connect to computer science, and certainly here you can imagine what if you want to write a program to spit out all these digits. It's actually a very simple program. It's just, or you could say something like while one equals one, n equals n plus one, print n, you know, and then end your while loop, something like that. It's very simple. 
Uh, for prime numbers, it's not too complicated either, to be honest, but the running time is certainly going to be quite a bit slower. Not going to be too bad. Um, you can maybe think, what's an efficient algorithm to compute prime numbers? That's an interesting question. Um, so what about something that's normal in every base? So everyone here has heard of Alan Turing? Very, very famous, very important, you know. In my eyes, one of the most important people of the last century. He was, you know, very important for starting you know, computer science. So um, there's something called computability theory. So um, I'm saying this real number, you can write a program in pretty much any language, any Turing complete language, to spit out as many digits as you want. So what we're going to say informally is that a real number is computable. If there's some way you can write a computer program, to spit out as many decimal digits as you want. Okay. Um, it turns out that actually most real numbers are not computable. So I don't know, you know this depends how, uh, how comfortable you are with the side of computer science, but um, there are some real numbers, for example, that you can actually prove. It's something like maybe you can know the first 12 decimal digits, but you can never know the 13th. I can give some references to papers if anyone's interested. Um, there's, some of these can be related to some interesting questions with halting problems and Turing machines, if that means something to some of you guys. But, um, so if, when I say give me an example of a real number with some property, I mean a computable real number, typically. So there were actually some examples of real numbers, normal in all bases, given by Shipinski and LeBay in 1918 and 1919, but they weren't computable. They were using some axiom of choice, and it was kind of cheating, but it's, it's not fair to blame them because Turing only really set down these rules some decades later. So it's okay. So Turing actually came up with the first example of a number that is normal in every basis, and, base, and there's a reason I'm not going to write it. So this is due to Alan Turing, and this is, I think, 1939, and this is in an unpublished manuscript. So he, he wrote this down. It's, it's in his collected works. If you go to the library, you can find it. And I'm not going to write it down because what he really did is he provided an algorithm for computing this number. And if you want n binary digits, it's going to take approximately 2 to the 2 to the n computations. So if I want 10 binary digits, it would take 2 to the 1,024 computations. If I want 11 binary digits, it would take 2 to the 2048 computations. Um, you can imagine uh, there is no way with our fastest computers that you leave them running from the, the Big Bang up to now that it's going to be anywhere near finished. Mm -hmm. I think I figured you might be able to get something like 7 digits with this algorithm and then not 8. I, for, I forget the numbers. You'd have to check it. Um, this is really bad. This is So one big thing in computer science is how fast can you make an algorithm? Um, and you want things, you know, exponential is bad, but this is much worse than exponential. This is, you know, doubly exponential. It's 2 to the 2 to the n. It's completely impractical. So it was a proof of concept. If you have all the time in the world, then you can eventually get the next binary digit. But this is why I'm not writing it down, because it's not something as simple as this. I can just do this in my head and write as many of these as I want. This, on the other hand, it's, it's totally crazy. Now, on the other hand, um, you can um, improve this. So there is a Veronica Betcher and Ted Slayman. So Veronica Betcher is a theoretical computer scientist in Buenos Aires, or Buenos Aires Argentina. And Ted Slayman is a logician at University of California, Berkeley. And they've done a lot of work on improving this and um, also some connections to logic and descriptive set theory. And uh, Betcher, Slayber, uh, Betcher um, Heiber, and Slayman in 2013 um, we're able to improve Turing's results and get something that um, runs in O to the N to the 2 plus epsilon time. And what I mean by this is we can get it um, to run as close to quadratic as we want. So it can be like, if you want N binary digits, maybe you can get it to um, take N to the 2.1 steps or N to the point or 2.01 steps. You can never quite get it to N squared, but you can get it close. So they gave an algorithm in 2013 to produce a number normal on all bases with a speed. Um, it's not any sort of theoretical um, boundary. Pro pro there might be a way to do it in linear time, who knows? So there's no, you know, it's not like sorting, for example. Has anyone studied sorting in computer science? Okay, so this is, you know, well, we can talk about some tangents. And by the way, if anyone wants to see like, some connection to something, even if it's not there, feel free to ask. I want to allow some participation. 
So I'm just going off on a computer science rant now. If you don't like that, I can go somewhere else. I, I, not be physically, but I mean the direction of the talk. I'll stay here no matter what. But, um, okay, so it's an example. So let's, let's say that I have um, 10, 10 students in my class. Okay? And I have their um, exams that I just graded. And, okay, I want to enter these exams into my Excel spreadsheet or something. Well, it's easiest if I get them in alphabetical order. So I take these 10 papers and I just kind of do something to sort them, okay, it doesn't take very much time. Well, what if I have 100 papers or 1,000 papers? So if you actually do this, print out 1,000 labels, sort it, you know, numbers say 1 to 1,000. Okay, how long does it take you to actually sort these? And it will take a very, very long time. If you do it just in kind of the most naive sort of way, then it'll take approximately 500,000 steps to sort these 1,000 papers. Because what happens is, if you do this in kind of a um, naive way, let's say you have n papers already. Well, you're making, on average, n divided by 2 comparisons. I think it's 250,000, actually, sorry. But, but anyways, you're taking about um, n over 2 comparisons, because it can land anywhere in there, but on average, it's n over 2. So you're adding, basically, if the expected number of times you have to do a, do a check, it's going to be 1 half plus 2 halves plus 3 halves up to, let's say, 1,000 over 2. And if you remember some, um, uh, some math from high school, you might recall that 1 plus 2 plus dot, dot, dot plus n is n times n plus 1 over 2. Maybe you remember that, maybe you don't. So basically, this number is going to be approximately 1,000 squared divided by 4. And that's really, really big. Um, you don't want to just do this in a naive sort of way. So this is a problem, this is an example given to beginning computer science students where um, you take something like this. For small values, it really doesn't matter how you do it because it's really quick. But for large values, it makes a huge difference. So as it turns out, there are some other faster algorithms. I don't want to say how to do these, it gets more complicated. But rather than taking about n squared steps to sort n papers, you can take about n times log of n steps. And that's, uh, in computer science, usually it's base 2 log. Here there's an implied constant. Maybe it's a 1 fourth, or maybe who knows what. So it's basically some constant times n squared, or some constant times n log n. So there's some algorithms that can do it at about this speed, but you can prove that you can't do any better than that. So if someone tells me, I have a way to sort papers using only 3 times n comparisons, you know they're wrong. So this is one of the things that, you know, when you have some algorithm, you can sometimes, okay, you can find better and better algorithms, but sometimes there's some theoretical reason that you know you can't do any better. And what about producing a number normal in all bases? Well, there's, there's no um, idea that there necessarily is some sort of bound. You know, the best you could possibly do is linear, because if you want n digits, well, you have to write the n digits out. It's certainly going to take at least n steps. But beyond that, there's uh, no idea, you know, what would be more efficient than that. All right. Um, how are we on time, by the way? We are, I think we're, we're over time, right? No, no, no. Oh, so, so 30, right. Okay, okay, we're good. Yeah, I forgot the starting time. Um, okay, so these are some basic, you know, I'm just talking about constructions of normal numbers and um, connections to some other areas, let's say. Um, how many people are interested in physics, let's say, for example? A few people, at least. Okay. So, um, has anyone heard of the ergodic hypothesis or anything like this? Is this okay. ergodic hypothesis? <laughs> ergodic hypothesis. Uh, okay. So, if it, I, I won't explain it any further, but you can kind of keep this in your mind when I'm describing this. Okay. So, let's, I'm going to be extremely informal on this, okay? And, um, Imagine, and I guess this would be coming from statistical physics, right? It would be the right, the right branch. So, um, just a, a full disclosure, I don't know that much about physics, so there might be some parts of the physics side that I kind of butcher. So, okay, I'm, I'm being recorded for posterity, but still, we'll just pretend if I say something wrong that I didn't say it. Um, so, imagine that you have um, this room, for example. Okay, the, the air in this room is made up of all kinds of things. You have some oxygen, some nitrogen, a bunch of other stuff, and these particles are all bouncing around. Um, you know, I need this, you know, and I assume everyone else here needs this oxygen to survive. And, um, you know, these particles are bouncing, it seems kind of a random sort of way. Um, one can ask the question, in the very, very, very distant future, should we expect at some point for all of the oxygen molecules to be on, say, this one half of the room, and then everything else to be on the other half? 
Okay. Now, typically, you wouldn't expect that because you could think things are kind of mixing and they look fairly uniform. But there's nothing really necessarily stopping this from happening. You can have all these collisions and things move around. And it's, it's, it's kind of this type of question that uh, we want to deal with. That, um, and I, I think some of this is even related to some, um, say, theories of origins of the cosmos, that if some crazy thing kind of runs enough time, you know, maybe eventually the configuration is right. And with, uh, Bolt, anyone heard of Boltzmann brains? You've heard? No, it's really good. Okay, so let, let me, okay, I'm going to really, really butcher the explanation on this, but let me just, just go with me on this. Um, maybe it's a time to stop the video so no one can hear me on this, but, but anyways. Um, the idea is that, okay, you know, in, in quantum mechanics you have all these random events happening all the time. That, you know, this tunnel's over here, this goes to this lower energy state, and, the, and you, the effect is, is very small for the most part because the chance of, say, me reassembling and appearing over there, it's actually possible. But it's extremely low probability. I mean, you know, just infinitesimally small. But what if you have uh, a really, really long time for everything to run? You know, and I don't mean a Google years. I don't mean a Google Plex years. I mean, you know, even longer than that. Um, then eventually, really, any sort of crazy event like this should happen. So the idea of a Boltzmann brain is that you have some vacuum or near vacuum, and then things are just kind of ha happening at random, and then at some point a brain assembles itself with memories of things that have happened, and I mean, it disappears very quickly because it can't, it's not a stable structure in the vacuum, but um, nonetheless, you have this sentient creature that just assembles itself out of nowhere. And there are some um, explanation, you know, there's some idea that, okay, are we just Boltzmann brains? Because it seems like it would be much easier for just a single brain to randomly assemble itself in the whole universe. So you should expect more likely that this is, you know, what we are. But of course, we don't think that's the case. So there's probably some hole in the theory. Um, but nonetheless, it's the idea that it's one of these processes that's, you know, it's running for eternity. You should expect, okay, eventually it should happen. Maybe there's some reason it doesn't. There might be a problem in our theory. Um, so there are a lot of these types of questions that some process runs on forever. Maybe it's some random quantum mechanical process. Maybe it's particles bouncing around in the room at random, and you see some configuration after some time. And the idea is there's some rule or some sort of randomness that's describing how your system is evolving over time. And we can, it turns out one of the, I think, very interesting breakthroughs of the last maybe century or half a century in mathematics is connecting these sorts of ideas to proving um, things about mathematical structures. So even the prime numbers, remember these prime numbers? There are some information we know about prime numbers by mathematicians who formalize some of these ideas and we're able to prove some precise mathematical results about these very concrete structures. And it's a branch of mathematics I'm going to write. It's called ergodic theory. Um, and my uh, PhD advisor was uh, um, very much in this area. I'm, I'm sort of in it. But I'll write it this way. You can uh, Google this. Um, I would not read the Wikipedia page. It's, it's too hard. Generally, reading Wikipedia to learn math, I think, is a bad idea. It's kind of a reference, really. You look somewhere else to learn math, to be honest. But you can Google this nonetheless. And there's a very deep connection between normal numbers and ergodic theory. So, and it's, it's actually a very simple connection. So I, I'm saying all these things are very hard to prove. What I'm going to write soon is actually very easy to prove, but it's extremely powerful. So I was mentioning this idea that, okay, things are, oh, and another thing too that follows this too is like planetary orbits. Like, is the, um, uh, is the, the solar system stable? for example. We actually don't know because it turns out that I think with like maybe three bodies we have an idea of what happens, but when we have, you know, the sun and then these eight other um, planets or whatever, whatever you want to consider a planet, but um, <laughs> um, I have no opinion on this matter. I'm just, but, um, you know, it's a stable because you can imagine there could be some resonance. And I, th I think I heard something that Mercury has a 1% chance of being thrown out in the next billion years or something like that. Don't. That's what I heard at some point. So there's, it's, these systems can be very chaotic. There's a lot we don't know about the structure, and this is another example that they evolve this 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 rule describes what happens to these you know giant particles that are planets at every second. Well, what happens long term? Um, is the solar system long term stable? I'm honestly, probably not. Is my feeling when I say like really really long term. Um, so what about what hap what sort of um, kind of let's say system of particles evolving describes a normal number? You know, this concept I showed you, it seems totally unrelated to this idea at first, but I claim it isn't. So let me, let me do something um, really, really simple that you probably learned in grade school. Um, what happens when you, uh, to a decimal expansion, when you multiply by 10? 
So let's take a number, let's say E, uh, 2.71828, so on. Well, 10 times E, you know, we don't need to do anything too complicated. All we do is shift the decimal point. So this is 27.18281. And then you multiply again by 10. 10 squared times E. So that's 271.82818. And, or sorry, sorry, sorry. Like that. And so on and so on. So every time you multiply by 10, you move the decimal point over. Okay, basic idea? So what we're going to do is we're, um, so we're going to be looking at what happens after the decimal point. So let's kind of remember, what does a decimal expansion actually mean? This is something we have an intuitive understanding of, but a lot of people actually don't know. And like I said, we're going back to grade school here. Um, but it, it helps sometimes to go back to simple things. So um, we'll go back to pi, for example. So 3.14159 and so on. Okay, what does this mean? This means 3, this is our 1's place, plus 1 divided by 10. This is a 10's place. It says how many times 1 tenth goes into it. Plus 4 divided by 10 squared. That's our 100's place. Okay. Plus 1 divided by 10 cubed, and so on. So let's say I'm given some real number. How would we determine the decimal expansion? And so it's kind of a general question, but let me write this with a picture. So I'm going to take the interval. We're just going to only look at the point after the decimal. And let's take the unit interval, and let's split it up into 10 pieces. Um, let's say 0 over 10 to 1 over 10, 2 over 10, 3 over 10, and so on. 9 over 10 to 10 over 10. So let's say I'm given some real number x. If x is here, what's the first decimal digit of x? 2, exactly. Because x is between 2 tenths and 3 tenths. So the tenths place is a 2. Okay? So x is equal to 0.2. And then let's determine the next one. Let's say that um, when I write 10x, I'm going to mean just look at the, the fractional part. Let's say that um, 10x is over here, the fractional part of it. So meaning after the decimal point. And then it's 0. OK, let's say that 10 squared x is over here. Then you get a 9. Or, yeah, then you get a 9. Okay. So this way, we can track what are the digits of x. So we're looking at this from a dynamical perspective. Remember I was saying before that we're, we're interested in this idea of looking at how particles evolve with respect to some rule. Well here, the decimal expansion, in some way, we're looking at the sequence x, 10x, 10 squared x, 10 cubed x, and so on. Okay, so this is, you think of x as some particle in the real line, and what rule tells you where it moves next? Well, you multiply by 10 and ignore everything left of the decimal point. Okay, where does it go? And it keeps bouncing around like this. And which of these intervals it lands in, this tells you what the decimal expansion is. So everyone, you know, is going, they think when I say a real number, well, it is the decimal expansion. No, this is a property of the decimal expansion. It's this dynamical property that's tracing where the real number is going as you keep multiplying by 10. But it's recording information. So, for example, if I can look at this sequence and say the distribution, say how it distributes over the intervals, then that can actually tell you about the digits and the blocks of digits. So, for example, um, 2, 0, well, what does that mean? That means actually, okay, that means we have a 2 and then we have a 0 afterwards. Well, this actually tells you that x is going to be in this interval 20 over 100 to uh, 21 over 100. So even pairs of digits, you can take this up into 100 pieces rather than 10. Well, then that tells you where these blocks of length 2 are when you sample along odd positions. So what this is doing, looking at the sequence, is actually telling you information about the decimal expansion. And it then becomes very easy to show the following. And this, I would say this is like the fundamental theorem of normal numbers. It's the most important thing about it, but it's very easy. If we say that x is normal in base 10, so let's call this theorem. Normal in base 10, if and only if, so that's equivalent to saying that 10 to the n times x, the sequence x, 10x, 10 squared x, and so on, is uniformly distributed. In 0, 1. 
And when I say uniformly distributed, I mean the chance of the sequence, the probability of the sequence enters the interval zero to one half is 50%. The probability that it enters um, one half to two thirds is one in six, and so on and so on for a very every interval. And why is this interesting? Because what happens is that this is a property of digits and kind of counting digits and all these things, and we're connecting it to this dynamical property. And there's all kinds of theory, uh, all kind of the use to study these these types of transformations and what happens when sequences distribute on some string shape or whatever. And so most of the things we know about normal numbers are actually proven on this side and then taken over here by that equivalence. So we have some connection with computer science, of course, generating algorithms. And there's also more I don't want to say about uh, finite automata and other types of things like this, but there, I promise there's a lot more. Um, this is not exactly physics, but it's certainly motivated by physics. And there's a huge theory over here. Um, I was mentioning that there's a very powerful theory. There was a result by uh, Green and Tao in 2004. Um, people heard of Terence Tao? So one person, yeah. So he's, um, in many people's opinion, it's a subjective thing, he's considered the best living mathematician in the world right now. And um, he, they proved in 2004 that if you look at the sequence of prime numbers, you can find arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. So what that means is, uh, like an example, that means that the difference between them is constant. So like three, five, seven, nine, for example, that's an arithmetic progression of like four with difference two. So the prime numbers is kind of this crazy object, and they were somehow able to use some ideas from this side of thing, not normal numbers exactly, but this, this general theory. And they prove that the prime numbers have this special structure. So there's actually a very powerful tool. This is one way that put people often say that both this, you know, applications and pure mathematics can kind of influence each other a lot. That there's a lot that physics or a, a, a now actually mathematical biology as well motivates us and tells us to look at it in mathematics. And then it goes the other way too, that you know, pure math, results of pure mathematics can have applications. So this thing that was motivated entirely by considerations in statistical physics is now telling me things about prime numbers. I don't want to give any indication how that works in this talk, but just I can such a You should, really. <laughs> okay. okay. Let's, let's talk about that. some ergodic Ramsey okay. theory and some. No problem. Yeah. Do you have a background in ergodic theory? Um, not really. <laughs> okay. Well, you don't want to know. Yeah, it's it's really it's really crazy. Okay. But I, I can reference the papers if anyone wants to know. Do please. Yeah. Do. Um, you really don't want to read it though. Trust me. But I'll, I'll Why? Sense. I don't want to read it. Okay. It's, it's, it's bad. I hear I mean, you. But if, if if you want to just kind of look, okay, it looks yeah, pretty like. Uh, yeah. Um, it's hard stuff. It's really hard stuff. You need several years of graduate courses to have any idea. Yeah. yeah. This is the problem with math. Is there's this really big learning curve to really seeing what goes on in most yeah, okay. of it. Like it's, um, but there, it's very good work. It's, it's very, very nice stuff. Um, so anyways, this gives you some idea that normality as a concept, it's, it's really equivalent to some idea of some uniform distribution in some space. So let me go to, I'm probably running out of time, but let me uh, mention another type of normality. I have eight more minutes. Um, so has anyone heard of a continued fraction expansion? Not One person, okay. And do you have a math background, or where's your background? I'm a chemist. Chemist, okay. So uh, I'm impressed. <laughs> Actually, my father's a chemist, so my father was a research chemist at General Motors. So I'm from Detroit, and that's where we, I don't know that much about chemistry, though. We've heard some things from him, but, okay. So, continued fractions. So, how many people did uh, math contests when they were younger, just out of curiosity, like Olympiads or anything like this? Okay, so I'll actually give a, a quick question that's um, pretty easy. Um, what about the following? So, evaluate. And when I say pretty easy, this is, of course, a sort of relative and subjective thing, but by the standards of what I'm asking, it's easy. 1 divided by 1 plus, 1 divided by 1 plus, 1 divided by 1, and so on. So it doesn't stop. It continues. <laughs> okay. Any ideas? Any ideas? By contest standards, it's easy. No, it's, we know for sure um, that it's going to be smaller than 1 because this is positive, yeah, it's, it's one divided by that, so it's less than 0 0.5. Nope. So, so here. Yeah, it's a completely limit. 
There's some symmetry. It's a limit. It's a limit, it's a limit of sequence. Yeah. So the, the key is symmetry. So let x be this. And look at this piece right here. This is x also. This is why I'm saying by contest standards, it's not too bad. So we basically solve x is 1 over 1 plus x. So x squared equals, uh, sorry, x squared uh, plus x equals 1 x squared plus x minus 1 equals 0, you can solve the quadratic. You get two solutions, a positive and a negative solution. It ends up becoming minus 1 plus root 5 over 2. This is 1 divided by the golden ratio. Mm -hmm. So a nice little trick. Um, this is an example of something called a continued fraction, though. So the general thing you're looking at is much harder to deal with. And you look at 1 divided by a1 plus 1 divided by a2 plus 1 divided by a3 plus and so on, where a, n are positive integers. So they can be 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Okay. And this is a, and we can symbolically write this as a1, a2, a3, and so on. Okay. So like with the decimal expansion, we can look at this as an infinite sequence of letters, but now we have an infinite alphabet. So rather than an alphabet with 10 letters, we have infinitely many. But it's still okay. It doesn't cause too many problems. It causes a few, but not too many. So let me ask. So, so we're still looking at this like, you know, uh, what about normality? What about normality of a continued fraction? Okay, so what should, you know, how would we even define what a normal number is here? Because we have infinitely many letters, maybe we want to weight them, you know, what should the weighting of 1 be? What should the weighting of, of 5 followed by 7 and so on? And I mean, I'm going I'm to kind of just tell you the answer, but it's because it's, it's actually a very hard question um, to really get this right. But we, we do the same setup as before. We have a transformation. Remember, in base 10, we multiply by 10 to shift the decimal point. Well, if we have a function, tx equals, let's say, the fractional part of 1 over x. So this means just kind of ignore the, the integer part. Okay, imagine if we, we invert this. We get a1 plus this part. Well, then we ignore a1. So all we're left with is a2, a3, a4, and so on. So we have some function that um, shifts. Now we need to find what's going to be the right distribution for looking at the sequence x, tx, t squared, x, and so on. And without knowing anything from ergodic theory, you're going to have to trust me on what is the right distribution. There's some specific rules we need. Um, I can answer this more later if anyone wants, but it would take uh, some time. Um, it's going to be the following distribution. So we're going to say that mu, let's say the probability of landing in some interval i, we're going to weight it like follows. It's going to be um, 1 divided by log 2 times the integral over i of dx over 1 plus x. So what is this? Just think about this from a probabilistic perspective. You have certain intervals that are just weighted a little bit more than others. So we integrate this function. So we say, what's the area under this curve? And why am I dividing by log 2? Well, I just want everything to add up to 1. So if you do the integral from 0 to 1 of this, you get log 2. So that's why I divide by log 2. So, OK, so what's generating a continued fraction expansion? We can do the same idea as we did with decimal. We're going to take um, the interval, and we're going to split it up now into infinitely many pieces from 1 half, 1 third, 1 fourth, and so on. And let's say we're going to graph tx. It's going to look like this. And so on. You can check maybe on a you know computer or whatever that it looks like this. So if x, for example, is in here, we're going to label this 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. If x is in here, then the first digit is 1. If x is in there, the first digit is 2, 3, 4, and so on. So in the same sort of way, iterating this transformation tells you what the digits of the continued fraction expansion are going to be. So in particular, what if I want to know, so we're going to, okay, so what we're going to say is that your normal for continued fraction expansion, if this sequence uniformly distributes with respect to this weight. So the probability that it lands in an interval i is this number right there. Don't worry how it came up with that, it's complicated, but there's some reason it's, it's, it's there. So what's going to be the probability for a normal continued fraction number that uh, you see the digit 1? Well, it's going to be mu of... 1 half to 1, which is 1 over log 2, integral from 1 half to 1 of dx over 1 plus x, 
and you can kind of pull out you know, stuff from an old course to do use substitution, blah, blah, blah. You can do it exactly, but the thing is this is approximately 0.415. You can do it exactly if you want, but what this means is that the digit one should show up about 41.5% of the time. You can check that if you want, but it's, it's, I, I, it is. Um, what's really strange, though, is that for a normal continued fraction number, the digits are no longer independent. So remember, for, for a, a normal number in base 10, the idea is the digits are independent. So you can check here, you can see, okay, well, what would correspond to two ones in a row? So you have to see, okay, you, you're in this interval, but then you're also mapped again to the interval one half to one. So it's gonna be basically what happens, we draw this line over here and project this down. It's gonna be this interval here that corresponds to two ones in a row. So you can uh, compute the integral of that region and divide it by log two. And it turns out that the answer you get is not equal to that squared. And that's strange. So it turns out there, there's something called mixing intergodic theory. There's, um, it gives you sort of an idea of, sort of a weak version of independence. It says, so there's, you know, full independence, which you're probably familiar with, you, you roll a die and the one result has no effect on the other, but you can have um, different levels of independence. So maybe you have a little bit of independence, but not too much. So it turns out that there's, there's some concept of this called mixing intergodic theory. There's strong mixing, weak mixing, um, Bernoullicity, ergodicity, and a bunch of others. And um, the continued fraction expansion has a fairly large degree of mixing, but it's, or sorry, a large degree of independence, but it's not full independence. And that's a little strange. Um, and you can check that here. So a normal number for continued fraction expansion, what's a frequency of 5 followed by a 38 followed by a 7? Well, it's much trickier than just computing these individually and multiplying them together. So then I could ask, what's an example of a normal number for continued fraction expansion? That's actually not a fair question at all. <laughs> you know, it, it was sort of fair for decimal expansion, but here it's not. Um, the, the, there aren't very many examples. I think I counted only seven in the literature. I have one or two of them, and then one of my colleagues has, I think, two of them, two or three of them, and then there's... Uh, the first one was due to Adler, Keenan, and Smordinsky in 1981. Um, and what they did is they basically took the numbers one-half, one-third, uh, two-thirds, one-fourth, and so on. And you can write a continued fraction expansion for each of these, and then you put them together, and it turns out you get a normal continued fraction expansion. It's not obvious at all that that works out. But it turns out that it does. Do we need to end? Um, yeah, actually, it's already one. Okay, we're one minute past, so I can end for questions on this. So. There's a lot more. There's a lot more stuff if anyone's curious. This is just kind of just a few things, so we'll stop now. Okay. Thank you very much. It was uh, one more example of our power of science. You know, sometimes we call this uh, lectures like this hard science. Uh, for those who like, you know, this hardcore stuff. Uh, okay, I understand something from your lecture, not everything. Yeah, that's typical in math talks. Yeah, yes. never understand and, but at least something I understood, and I think it's like my uh, destination. <laughs> yes. So achievement. Achievement. Achieve. 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 Yeah, yeah. Yes. And by the way, uh, our last lecture was also about mathematics. Uh, it was about uh, uh, theorem. Um, theorem of Oh, one problem, one problem, okay. oh, okay. and its um, explanations and uh, movement. Any question? To go on. Any, any <laughs> you know, I can question? Do that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> question? No, that was a you know suggestion. <laughs> It's, it's okay if it's a small Okay, I have a uh, small question. I, I, read, uh, I read about uh, normal numbers and I read that uh, they could uh, be used in uh, computer science in um, data structure, structure, mm -hmm. um, structure, um, processing. Structure, you mean like organizing data? <coughs> And there could be random number generator, you mean? Yes, yes. Uh, I, I just, I'm sorry, I just forgot every word. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Short and even yeah. Ukrainian words. 
Um, just soon. Maybe in Polish I might know. But... <laughs> oh really? Okay. How was that? Mówię trochę po polsku, bo czy szaf polskiego. It's easy, you know. Yeah, got it. Polish is much harder than this. In cryptography, so, I, I, I think so. Yeah. I remember in cryptography. Yeah. So for written data, for uh, like saving data, no. Well, that, yeah, for like encrypting it, and to be honest, I don't know much of the details of that, so I might kind of change your question if you're okay with that to slightly something okay. slightly different, but. Um, it's it's very possible. Like the the one thing I'm a little bit worried about in general with using normal numbers for too many of these types of applications, where you want some amount of randomness, is that um, in some sense, actually, the the amount of randomness is it's kind of um, weak and not enough, in my opinion. So this Champernon number, for example, that I wrote one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so on. Well, the problem is that it's um, it's random in this this weak sense I gave, but it's too structured. So for a lot of applications, it's, it's actually really not enough. Um, it takes too long of a time for certain things to show up. So there's a concept of something called discrepancy. That um, if, if this, And this might mean something different than what you guys are thinking. Um, this is, yeah, because it's, it's a word that's used in a lot of places. So I mentioned that a number, so I mean this might go maybe sort of towards your question. We'll talk about some other things in the process. Um, remember, I'm saying that a number is normal in base 10 if and only if this sequence is uniformly distributed in mod 1. Now, you can imagine that there can be some sequences like this that distribute eventually well. You know, everything's in limit. So it may be the case that this sequence just stays between 0 and 1 half for Google places and then eventually starts doing some other stuff. Or even when it starts doing some other stuff, it takes a really, really long time for this limit to approach what it really you know, can be. And discrepancy, I, could, I can write it down, and if anyone's curious, the definition is not too bad. Um, but discrepancy provides a measure of how well a sequence is uniformly distributed. Um, and you can have normal numbers of different levels of discrepancy. So I think the best you can get, it, it's, 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 it's some quantity that goes to zero, but you want to know how quickly it goes to zero. The best you can get is something like n divided by, or sorry, log n divided by n, I think. Um, and no one has ever constructed a normal number with discrepancy this low. So I think the Champernon number, it's something, it's, 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 it's really bad. It's something like was maybe 1 divided by log n, which you can imagine goes to 0 very, very, very slowly. Um, so one of the problems, I think, with, with actually using normal numbers for applications where you want a high degree of randomness is that um, even though we might even know like a typical real number actually has some optimal discrepancy, no one's ever been able to make one that does. So there's, I didn't mention the side of things that sometimes some people are constructing normal numbers. Um, they're not looking at just constructing a normal number, they're looking at something that has a better and better discrepancy. And I believe it was uh, 11, I think, has the current record on this. I forget what his discrepancy was. But it, it's nowhere near this, it's much better than this. So it's kind of a matter of how well you compress things, how well you, you put them together. Um, something like the Champernon number, it's, it's very inefficient. You know, it looks nice, and it's a great example to write out, but the compression is very inefficient. So, um, I think in a lot of cases, I actually feel that at least right now, just being normal, I think is too weak of a condition for most applications. I think you need something that is a bit stronger. Um, I don't know specifically for cryptography, but that's generally my feeling that I wouldn't use it for a random number generator or something else, unless you can develop some theory that lets you pass even stronger statistical tests for randomness. So I'd rather, I don't know, use the atmospheric thing, you know, like random.org uses or something right now, before I'd start using normal numbers until that gets developed better, but it might be developed better in some, uh, maybe even a decade or so. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but sort of. Yes, yes, actually you answered, uh, please. Uh, about plasticity, you say that uh, there are no uh, complete uh, independence. Is it uh, means oh. what uh, uh, randomness of ever uh, next uh, number in this row? Uh, there are no uh, real randomness. Is, it, is there uh, some function about it? Okay, so are we talking about continued factoring? Okay. Yes, yes. So, so um, you can think about it like this. So let's let's say that you're uh, you know flipping a coin. It's heads or tails. Okay. 
Now, if, if these events are independent, then no matter whether I see heads or tails, there's always a 50% chance you see either heads or tails. Now, for continued fraction expansion, okay, we have some probability, for example, just starting that we see a one, it's 41.5%. Well, what I'm saying here is that if, you're given, if it's given that you see a one, well, then the chance that you see another one is something different than 41.5%, but it's close. So there's a precise way, and there's several different ways of doing this, to quantify you know, what sort of degree of correlation and dependence you have. So there are, there are things called Markov chains, there's, this, this satisfies a property called strong mixing. I don't want to write that, um, but there, there's something you can, you can Google it um, if you're a little you know, masochistic. Um, but um, there, there is a way to, to quantify it and you can talk about, as it turns out actually, the, the, the independence, it gets better as you go further out. So let's say you start with a one, well, what's the distribution of digits? If you, if you know your first digit is a one, what's the distribution a million digits away? Well, there actually is some dependence, but it's, it's um, less than just the second digit. So this lack of independence, it goes to zero at some rate. And this is something that's studied also. It's, it's very good to know. And everything balances out in some nice sort of way. There's a lot of structure. Um, a lot of it is honestly very difficult to understand, but um, it's, it's also interesting. It's one reason that we like continued fraction expansions. And I, actually, this isn't your question. I wanted to say one further thing about this. might seem like an unmotivated thing to, to people. We just write this strange fraction. Um, why do we care about decimal expansions? The reason we care about decimal expansions is because of money. Because it's easy to add money, easy to multiply. We have a simple algorithm. So hundreds of years, you know. Well, they're actually not good for a lot of mathematical applications, and that's where the continued fraction expansion comes in. Continued fractions show up everywhere in mathematics. It turns out that in some ways you could say that this is nature's way of you know, encoding numbers. So, for example, you know, if I write something like you know, 3.14 something or whatever, well, how much information does this give us if we stop at some point? What's the difference between the actual number? And it turns out that if you look at a continued fraction expansion, this in some ways gives you the best possible approximation if you cut it off at some point, which is that much information. Um, I don't want to say precisely what I mean by that, but there's, there's some way of quantifying that. So, in some ways, all these types of decimal expansions are less efficient in, in a precise way. Um, and so there's a lot of reason. There, there are many other places I don't even want to say now where these come up. So it is very motivated, and understanding more about continued fraction expansions, not just the degree of independence or randomness, but many other pieces of the structure. It's important in number theory and geometry and a bunch of other places. There's a big connection between continued fractions and, for example, hyperbolic geometry. Um, and I, many, many other things. So there, there's, this is part of where I say, you know, in mathematics, everything's interconnected. Or not everything, but a lot of things are, let's say. And often finding a bridge between two areas is what gives you a lot of powerful stuff. And so that's a more a little different than you, but you know. Okay, I have maybe it's a little bit silly question, but it's how okay. many real examples do we know of normal numbers? So how many examples of normal numbers do we know? For so, sure. Okay, the, and, and when you say normal number, just to be clear, we mean something like normal in base ten or something. Yes. Okay. So not normal in all bases. Uh, let it be for it base ten. Okay. Um, let's let I, I I don't know the actual answer, but let's let me give a guess of something like between 50 and 100. Maybe closer to 50, I'm not sure. But that, that's my rough guess based on, because I haven't actually read all these papers, I know roughly at what rate things are being done. So we know that actually uh, normal numbers are uh, like major numbers in, in the real. Okay, it's hard basic. to explain. In basic, not major, basic. No, normal numbers. Mm -hmm. So uh, they take bigger part from all the real numbers, yes? In one sense, but there's another sense that they don't, that I didn't get into. <laughs> so, <laughs> this, this, yeah, so, um, let, let me say, if anyone happens to know, they have the set of normal numbers has full Lebesgue measure, but it's a meager set. So the set of non-normal numbers is a co-meager set with full Hausdorff dimension, for the record. Um, basically, what's, what's happening is that there are many different ways to talk about largeness in mathematics. So, Sometimes you can show that a number exists by showing that the set of those numbers satisfies some largeness property. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that these largeness properties, they come from different places and they don't always coincide. Mm -hmm. So what I say when I'm talking about largeness here, I mean from a probabilistic perspective. But there's a topological notion of largeness where um, it's small. Mm -hmm. 
And actually, the set of non-normal numbers is larger in pretty much every other sense than, mm -hmm. um, than the probabilistic one. So they're fractal. People like fractals. You see these like pretty pictures. These fractals. The set of non-normal numbers is a fractal that's as large as a fractal can possibly be. Um, so these things are actually, it's actually, you know, it's, it's very delicate, and it's kind of hard for me to say without actually going into the technical details, but, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of large in one way, but then not others. I don't know if that answers your question or not, or, yeah. Okay, it's okay. Stupid questions have interesting answers sometimes. So. Uh, then I have another question, not about real numbers, yeah. about your work, uh, your uh, subject, subject of your work. Is it related to this stuff or no? Oh, oh, my, the, what, my research is yes, it? Yeah, yes, it is, it is, yeah. Um, it's in kind of a different, like I do myself have a couple constructions of these one types of normal, normal numbers I mentioned and a couple results, but it's, um, my work is, it's, this is kind of the starting point of it, but it goes in a different direction. So does anyone know what a descriptive set theory is? Descriptive? Descriptive set theory. So let's let's put up, let's say this in math. Um, you know, one of the um, you know math math it's a very social subject. One thing that people think, okay, maybe you just do it in the basement. You're blah blah blah. Okay, you know, I'm I'm traveling the world working with different mathematicians. I was working with a guy in India for a month, actually exactly a year ago. Uh, there's a guy in Kiev that I work with. There's a guy in near Dallas, Texas. I work with. There's all these different people and. The best results in mathematics occasionally are done by some lone wolf, but usually it's a matter of people work together and then someone builds off that result and so on. And very much being within the community, there are some downsides, which I'll mention in a minute, but it's, it helps to be working with other people and know what's going on in the research. Often the, the whole is bigger than the sum of the parts. You know, People play different roles in the collaboration. Um, and so I have many co-authors. I have written single author papers, but I'm happy to never do that again because it's not as fun. Um, now, there, the thing though is that with, with these sorts of social structures, there are some benefits of it and there are downsides as well. People are still tribal, they have their own little groups, they fight for funding, they do all this. And the other thing too is I was mentioning some things, I was telling you not to read certain papers because you need to read too many things first. This is one of the problems in mathematics, that things can get too, um, too abstract and specialized. And it's basically impossible sometimes to know what someone else is doing. Now, so the problem happens that, okay, maybe there's some area between here that would just be amazing if you can bridge, but the people are kind of tribal, they're staying to their own group, and they don't understand each other anyways. So to be honest, what I'm doing mostly is I am talking to basically everybody. Connecting people. Connecting people, <laughs> yeah. This is something that needs to be done more. So my research is mostly in normal numbers. There is a descriptive set theorist near Dallas, Texas, uh, Steve Jackson, that um, I've been basically, when I've been going around the world giving these talks and the conferences and everything, um, I feel there's a lot of applications of his area to all these other different things that I can also touch upon well, uh, as well. So I've been connecting that to other things in number theory and dynamics, and we've gotten some results that I think are fairly fundamental results that should have been proven 30 years ago, except no one even thought to look in that direction. So we have a very a recent one that was I'm very happy with that was published in a very nice journal. And we have several more we're in the process of doing. So in the terms of, you know, what is my research about? I mean, it is about normal numbers, at least at its core, but the, you know, more spirit, it's been a matter of connecting these ideas and also ideas from something called descriptive set theory to other things as well, and producing results that really no one thought to ask until recently. And I don't know if that, that kind of answers the question or not, but yeah. you can Google, you can Google my name, you do this. You look on Bill Mance, and then you type A R X I V. This is a preprint server. Um, these aren't the final versions of the papers. Usually, I kind of lazy about updating, and it's enough. Basically, you can look at my papers. I have um, some lower, tw maybe twenty twenty one out there, and you can, if you're curious, you can look there and see roughly what I've been working on. And so. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Any other questions? No. Then uh, I would like to say several words about our clubs because I was so stressful, stressed. <laughs> I forgot to say about uh, our meetings before lecture. So, uh, well, who we are? Yes. <laughs> who are? Who yeah. are? But then can you tell me later? <laughs> <laughs> Is that okay or not? Yeah, but uh, for the people here. Okay. At 
and for, for people who uh, came later uh, sure. after the beginning and for you, actually uh, we arranged uh, some kind of uh, science communication club uh, where we uh, invited different uh, scientists who uh, present their research or maybe who just present their, uh, like, uh, their subjects. Uh, and uh, actually it's the sixth year, uh, so it's the sixth uh, season of our meetings, of our club. And uh, we uh, cover completely different topics of science, from math, math physics, biology to history, uh, Culture, yeah, so uh, very different uh, kind of topics. And uh, thank you very much for your good presentations. It was, uh, uh, yes, thank you very much. It was interesting. Uh, it was uh, unusual for us in some way. Uh, and <laughs> Yes, yes, and actually uh, I forgot to say uh, that this lecture is um, dedicated to the uh, year of mathematics in Ukraine. So uh, 2020 is the year of mathematics in Ukraine. It's <laughs> It's And uh, our friend Irina Yugorchenko, who uh, gave uh, presentations here also, uh, she recommended uh, Bill to recommend to our club for Bill. Yes, yeah. <laughs> recommended us for Bill to visit. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so thanks for her. And uh, Bill did not tell about his blog. Like you said, like, actually, uh, we have. I think that we should like uh, now we have uh, kind of a uh, coffee break uh, with tea, with cookies, and I think we can uh, discuss it uh, in informal. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 Всі, хто спав, прокидайтеся, тому що в нас, в нас наступного четверга в нас лекції не буде, але через четверг у нас буде лекція, яка присвячена лекція по біології, присвячена вона безсмертно. Життя і смерть живих тварин. Пані, пані Ольга Лутинська, ви будете виступати чи ні? Що ви вирішили? Що ви вирішили? Просто принесем мертвого хамічка. Присвятим за Березні ми будемо запрошувати ще одного лектора з Києва. Юля, Юля, хвилиночку вбач. It's an organization problem. Ми хочемо запросити біолога з Києва Олександра Скороходова, він відомий популяризатор науки. А ви можете допомогти нам, у нас там стоїть скринька, киньте, хто скільки може, це йому на квиток. Маєте на увазі, що ви допоможете нашим... Хто скільки може? Так, допоможете нашому проєкту, тому що ми збираємо на квиток, щоб ми могли запрошувати лекторів з інших міст. І, власне, в нас наступна лекція буде пана Костянтина Задорожнього і, може, пані Олі Утєвської. Сюрприз. Лекція про життя і смерть живих тварин. А закінчуємо ми місяць історію Сергія Дейнеко про Маннергейма. Хто вже слухав нас про фінську кампанію, той в курсі. Власне, це буде присвячено річниці фінської кампанії. Приходьте, поговоримо про Фінляндію. Він, до речі, дуже класний лектор. Він такий живий. Шукайте нас у Фейсбуці, підписуйтесь на нашу групу. Я дуже прошу, не вистачає ваших фідбеків, тому що висіла об'ява цієї лекції майже тиждень, ну, сама картинка, там було, ну, п'ять лайків, навіть не про це, з неправильною датою, і тільки через кілька днів мені Льоша написав, що, типу, от не факт, тому, будь ласка, фідбеки, це дуже корисно і дуже приємно. 
Навіть якщо вони негативні. Да, а до речі, лайки, і навіть якщо ви не збираєтесь йти на нашу лекцію, Само заходьте лайки. і ставте, що, що цікавитесь, тому що це допомагає поширенню. Чим більше там цікавиться, тим більше людей бачить, що така лекція є. Дякую дуже багато. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you.